Good morning. Thank you for joining us, uh, Ridge Church Online. We hope you've been enjoying the sermons if you've been in watching for a while. Um, just a couple things for you to know before we hop into today's sermon. Our soccer camp registration is going to be closing soon. It's happening July 8th to 12th. If you've not signed your kids up yet, now is the time. We don't want you to wait and miss out on the opportunity. Uh, the other thing for you to know is that if you are ever wanting to connect with one of our staff, please don't hesitate to reach out. We would love to connect with you uh, so you can hear about our church and how we want to serve uh, Jesus in our city. And we hope that you would come to know and love Jesus and that you would be known and know how much you're loved by Jesus. And so thank you again for joining us online. Let's hop into the sermon. Well, good morning. My name is Aaron. If you don't recognize me, I am the youth director here at Ridge Church. Over the last three years, I've been involved in or attended about 20 different weddings. Um, and that's quite a bit, especially when nine of them are in one year. Um, but typically when I bring that up, um, let's say particularly with an older generation than mine, uh, they'll flip the conversation uh, and they'll say, you know what? We remember that stage of being in a lot of weddings, but now we actually attend more funerals than weddings. Uh, in my thoughts, I will go, wow, that killed the mood. But it's true. The older you get, the more you realize that death is a much more common thing than we realize. And the reality of it is that it comes for all of us one way or another. Despite our best efforts to hide from it, to prolong it, or even to ignore it completely, death works its way into our lives. The separation, the finality, the void of where that person used to be, that friendship used to be, now it's gone. I remember in my own life, in grade 11, petting my dog uh, as we put her down. I remember the unexpected and the sudden passing of my friend Caleb when I was 18. And I remember a couple years ago being a pallbearer at my grandmother's funeral as I carried her to her final resting place. And yet in the midst of death, Jesus shows up and he brings life. So my first question for you today is this. Do you actually believe that Jesus can raise the dead? Do you actually believe that Jesus can bring life out of death and that he can resurrect the things that are dead? What about the things in your own life that are dead? Not necessarily death physically, but death spiritually, emotionally. The dreams, the goals that you had, the relationships, your marriage, breaking habits, creating new ones, that person who has no interest in Jesus at all. See, we're in John chapter 11 this week. We're talking about Lazarus, um, and we're reading from verses 1 to 44. So I'm not actually going to read the whole story today, but I would encourage you after this to read it on your own time. If you find it difficult to answer the question of uh, Jesus being able to raise the dead to life, uh, you're not actually alone in this. John highlights that this is a very common response to the question of, eh, probably not. Mary and Martha, the sisters of Jesus, both of them say the exact same thing to him when they come face to face with Jesus. They say, if you had not been here, my brother would not have died. Sorry. They say, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And the crowd around them at the funeral kind of whispers to each other and they say, could not he who opened the eyes of a blind man have kept this man from dying? Like, come on, this, this is easy for you. You've healed people before. No one except for Jesus expected Lazarus to walk out of that tomb. And the reason for that, um, psychologically, would be considered the experiential conditioning of our minds, where we let our past experiences dictate the, what we expect. It's the conditioning of our mind. We can, we're conditioned our minds based on our experiences to expect certain things and certain outcomes. <clears throat> 
I worked in construction for a bit, and I would expect that if I dropped a hammer, it would land on my toe. Why? Because I did it before. When it comes to death, <clears throat> we are born into a world where people die. It's the reality. It happens often and regularly. And generation after generation after generation after generation has proven that people don't rise from the dead. That when people die, they stay dead. Death is death. It's final. There is no reversing it. It's scientifically and empirically proven. That's what we come to expect. Well, I remember when I graduated college, uh, one of my friends said they had a gift for me. And I was like, great, that's, that's fun. I like gifts. Um, I'm not particularly a gift person, so to speak. I don't think much of them. Um, very rarely have I been astounded by a gift, and so I just don't come to expect much from gifts. But I remember opening <clears throat> their gift for me for my graduation and seeing this hat that I had been kind of humming and hawing about and going back and forth on, do I buy it, do I not? It was a special design. It was, um, I'm really into Formula One, and so it was one of the teams that was uh, had designed a special hat for one of the races, and I was going back and forth, and I really liked the design. And inside the box was this hat, and this person had taken note of me going back and forth on it. Um, and in that moment, when I opened that box, my expectations were blown away, and I was left speechless. Their gift did not, was not bound to what my expectations were of a gift. In the same way, God is not bound by our expectations or our perception of his limitations. If you go through and read the book of John again, John, uh, Jesus does a bunch of different miracles. He turns water into wine. He heals a sick kid. Uh, he heals a man that was paralyzed. He feeds 5,000 people with a couple loaves of bread and some fish. He walks on water and he healed a man that was born blind. But up until this moment, Jesus had not, in the book of John, raised someone from the dead. There was no precursor or expectation that this was something Jesus would do, or maybe even could do. No one was expecting it. And yet, Jesus does it. He calls Lazarus out of the tomb. What does that mean? It means that maybe we should start to expect Jesus to bring life out of the things that we consider dead and have written off. Maybe we should expect Jesus to actually bring life. Maybe we should expect that he actually enjoys bringing up. It means that nothing and no one is off the table for Jesus. It means that he can reach into the deepest and darkest moment of your life and actually bring healing bring forgiveness and grace. He can bring reconciliation. It's the work that he does, and it's something that he will always do. See, death could not stop Jesus, but the irony of this is that you think your mistakes can. You think that the things that are wrong in your life could be beyond the work of Jesus. And the answer to that is you're wrong. Death couldn't stop Jesus. He called Lazarus from the tomb with a couple words. What could he do with you who are alive? Of course you can lead someone to faith, despite your lack of education. Of course you can make a difference, despite not having a lot of money. And yes, Jesus can turn the heart of the most devout atheist. Do you actually believe that? One of the responses to this, uh, particularly among Christian circles, is to say, yes, Jesus can. He can do all of those things, but he's going to actually wait and put it off until he sets all of creation right in the last days. Um, on his second coming, he'll make everything right. And we push, we push everything off until that future reality of heaven. Everything will stay broken until that point. And once again, we see that John actually puts this into the narrative as well. Jesus asks Martha, um, do you believe that your brother will rise again? 
And look at her response in verse 24. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Yes, one day he's going to be raised again to life. But for now, the reality is he's still in the tomb. He's still dead. One day, yes, but right now, no, it doesn't change the present. There was a pastor um, in California and kind of around the United States in the 20th century. His name was George Eldon Ladd. Uh, and he is kind of the theologian where we get this idea of the already but not yet. He writes this in one of his books. He says, the mystery of the kingdom is the paradox of its being both present and future. It's already here, but it has not yet come in fullness. So what does that mean? It's a jumble of words. It means that the expectations we have of heaven, that there will be no more sickness, no more death, no more pain, no more suffering. It means that Jesus is actually bringing those into the present. That's his response. His response to Martha saying, yes, on the last day, is, him, is Jesus saying, I am the resurrection and the life. I am here. I am now the resurrection and the life. I will bring life to the things that are dead. And he calls Lazarus from the tomb. The reality of heaven is breaking in to the present moment in time. It is here. It is now. Things that are dead can be turned alive again. Things that you've given up on can be redeemed. The time is ripe. And yet, at the same time, it is not fully here. Heaven is not fully on earth. It doesn't take a scientist or a genius to realize that. Our world is still broken and corrupted. There is still sickness and pain and death and sorrow and heartbreak. It's the world we live in. And the natural question to ask in that moment is, does this mean that God is not actually strong enough to bring heaven fully here, right now, fully present at this moment in time? Why would he not? Of course, the answer to that is no, it's not a matter of strength or power. If God can disarm and reverse death, yes, he can fix the rest of the problems in the world. Jesus tells this uh, parable in Matthew chapter 13, where this farmer, this sower, uh, this master, gets his servants to plant a bunch of wheat. Right? Pretty natural, especially if you're from Saskatchewan. Um, but he gets them to plant a bunch of wheat, and then someone comes in the middle of the night after they've planted and plants a bunch of weeds. And the weeds start growing up, and his servants go to him and say, hey, should we start pulling out the weeds? Like, we just, we had planted a bunch of wheat, but should, we should pull the weeds out. And his answer to this says, is this. He says, no, because while you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Rather, let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds, tie them up in bundles to be burned. Then gather the wheat and bring it to my barn. Peter, in one of his uh, letters later in the Bible, writes that God is patient and wanting all to come to repentance. Excuse me. God is patient and wanting all to come to repentance. Which means that the reality of the It's not here yet. Heaven's not fully here yet. The world's not fully been set right. It's not a matter of strength or willingness on God's part. It's a matter of patience. That he's actually waiting to do it. He's delaying, but not completely. It will come. It's just not yet here yet. And until that moment, we live in this tension of bringing life into a broken world. See, Lazarus was brought back to life, but eventually he had to die again. The paralyzed man that Jesus healed got up and was walking around, but eventually as he got older, his body would start to slow down and break down until he as well died. The blind man could see, he could walk around, he could do everything, but eventually his eyes probably got a little bit worse as he got older. And yet, at the same time as being in this broken world, we know that God works all things 
for good. And we know that one day there will be no death. There will be no sickness. There will be no pain. The joy and love and peace will be fully realized in our lives and the world. And while right now we have open access through Jesus to the presence of God, one day we will have full access to the full presence of God, more so than we do now. So what does it mean for us in the meantime? It means that we have to realize not everything is going to be sunshine and ice cream. And that life might not happen the way that we want it to. See, Mary and Martha, along with everyone else present at this funeral to mourn for Lazarus, wanted, they sent word to Jesus while he was sick. He said, Jesus, come and heal him. We, you've healed people before. We know that you can heal him. Come and heal our brother. And Jesus wants that. We know that. He says he loved Lazarus. And in John chapter, or John 11, verse 4, he says this, The sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Jesus wants Lazarus to be alive and healthy. Mary and Martha want Jesus to be, or Lazarus to be alive and healthy. And you read that for the first time. You read Jesus' response to the message that Lazarus is sick. And you go, sweet. He's going to heal him. He's going to go. He's going to be like, bam, you're healed. And then it's going to be good. Uh, and his response is to wait. He waits for Lazarus to die. And we go, what? What? He makes Mary and Martha and everyone else sit in the reality that Lazarus was dead. And Lazarus was in a tomb until he hears the voice of Jesus calling him out again. All for the glory of God. See, the end result's the same. Mary and Martha wanted Lazarus healed and alive, and he was. Jesus wanted Lazarus healed and alive, and he was. But he took a different route to glorify God in a different, in a better way. Here's the difficulty. As much as we want our lives to go well, for things to be alive, and for the work of Jesus to be in our uh, life and reality, that we want things to go well, we want the good things of heaven to come to earth. Things being done for the glory of God means that we need to put our own expectations aside of how Jesus is going to do it. Because maybe Jesus wants to do it in a way that's different to what we expect for how we expect him to do it, for the way in which he's going to do it, for the time in which he's going to do it. We make all these plans about how we want to live and we do our best to live upright and righteous and good lives that honor God. But at the end of the day, it's about God's glory. And maybe God wants to use the brokenness in our lives and in the world around us to actually bring glory to his name in a way that we don't predict. We want to we move away from the pain and the brokenness and the suffering. And that's good, that's natural. That's what God wants as well. But at the same time, God is not afraid to use the broken things in our world to glorify his name. So whatever it is, whatever you're holding on to, whatever you're wanting Jesus to raise from the dead, are you willing to hold it in an open hand and say, Jesus, this is what I want. This is what I'm hoping for. This is what I'm praying for. But not my will, but yours. For the glory of God. It means that we are bringing life into a broken world. And to bring life into a broken world also means that there will still be grief and heartbreak in the middle of it. And what I can't leave without saying to you is that Jesus actually sits in the middle of that with you. He sits in the heartbreak. He sits close. When I was three years old, my family went over to Ontario and we visited my grandma and grandpa's farm. And uh, 
as a three-year-old, you know, you're feeding the sheep, petting the donkey, doing all the things. And I'm, I remember walking around kind of like the barn, and I'm standing in one of the doorways, and I turn, and I see this sheep, uh, this ram. And this ram decided that it didn't like me, um, and that I was too cute, and I was stealing all of its attention. And so as it was making its way outside the barn, uh, it decided that it was also going to knock me over and that it didn't care about me. And it knocked me over right into a pile of manure. <clears throat> and as a three-year-old that was born and raised in the city, my natural response, obviously, is to just cry because I'm now covered in manure. Happens in that moment. My dad comes over and picks me up and starts to make me clean again. And if I'm honest, I only actually have two memories of that whole event because I was three. Um, I remember like looking down through the doorway and seeing the sheep and thinking, well, I don't remember thinking this, but in, I'm inferring this sheep doesn't like me. I don't like it. And then I remember crying at the sink with my hands covered in manure as hands that were bigger than mine washed mine clean. See, when my dad picks me up out of the pile of manure, there is every chance that he's going to get manure on his shoes, right? When we're at the sink and my hands are being washed, the only way to actually wash my hands good enough is to actually get a little manure on your hands and not to be afraid of it on his hands. <clears throat> John 1 verse 14 says this, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God became human and dwelt among us. He became one of us. He became one with us. It means that in every situation, Jesus actually understands the feeling and the pain and the hurt and the sorrow and the grief. He is weeping at the tomb of Lazarus, even though he knows I'm about to raise him from the dead, I'm still going to sit in this moment of grief and sorrow. He hates it. He hates death. Why? He has experienced it. He's experienced the finality and the void that it causes. He's experienced it. Everything that you go through, God understands because God became a human. So I hope that you find that encouraging. Whatever pain, whatever betrayal you have gone through, Jesus understands it happened to him as well. He's close. He's not far off. So whether you need that encouragement today or whether you keep that for a day where you will need it, remember that Jesus knows and understands. And I'll end with this. The story of Lazarus is not just a funeral passage that we say to get out of grief, to feel that. It's not just a feel-good story of, oh, another one, that's so good. It's actually a precursor of what is to come. See, Jesus didn't stop at raising Lazarus from the dead. Jesus then went to the cross and died in your place. He experienced death so that you could experience life. The book of Hebrew goes once for all. That Jesus died once in your place as a sacrificial lamb to make things right with God, to overcome death and sin once for all people for all time. For all people that want to put their faith and their trust and their belief in Jesus, your sins have been covered past sins, the ones that you're working through right now, and the ones that you don't know that you're going to do in the next X amount of your life. But it doesn't stop there either. Jesus actually rose from the dead as well. He was resurrected so that one day you could also be resurrected with him, that you could live in glory with him, that you can have a future and a hope beyond what this world will try and offer you. 
but it's also a story that forces you to confront a God that can actually raise the dead. That a God who actually wants to shift your life here and now and is not content to leave you where you are. And so you have to choose. Will you let Jesus move into the darkest moments of your life and turn them into the brightest stars for the glory of God? Or are you going to write it off as a fairy tale that actually has no effect on today other than maybe it's a bit of a feel good? Are you going to continue to try and do things on your own or are you going to trust the one who can turn death into life? Let us pray. Jesus, today we pray that you would meet us where we're at, that you would sit in the moment in our grief, in our pain, in the brokenness. We have nothing to offer you. And Jesus, we pray that you would bring life. I pray that you would give us the confidence to ask you to bring life. And I pray that you would do so in a way that will bring and glorify your name. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Well, hi, my name is Jonathan. I'm the lead pastor here at Ridge Church. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that it was just a great opportunity for you to connect and learn more about following God and knowing Jesus. And we just want to invite you to continue to engage with us here. But we also believe that one of the best ways to follow Jesus is in the context of community. And so let me just take a quick moment and tell you what Ridge Church is all about. We're really about three things. The first thing is about Jesus. Above all, uh, Jesus is the reason that we exist. Our goal, our desire is that you would know Jesus and be known by Jesus and that he would change and transform your life. Second, we believe that community is really important. You know, in a world with so many digital connections and so few genuine connections, we believe that one of the best ways to live life, one of the most healthy ways, and certainly one of the the ways to follow Jesus best is in the context of community. And so regardless of what stage of life you're in or uh, where you're at in your spiritual journey, we want to invite you to come and to join us and to walk with a few others, to be known by them and to know them as we follow Jesus together. And then thirdly, we're about city. And by that, we mean that we want to be a place and a people who love our city, who love our neighbors and serve them and care for them and just walk alongside of them so that our city flourishes. And we want to be known by our city as a group of people, as a church that offers hope and life and care and love to anyone who's looking for that kind of thing. So that's really what we're all about. Jesus, community, and city. And we'd love to have you join us. If you want to know more, just fire off an email to hello at ridgechurch.ca and someone will get back to you. Or better yet, just come by for a service, 10.30 Sunday mornings. Look forward to seeing you soon.